Calvary Chapel Divine. Good morning, all those that are joining us online. We welcome you. We ask that you would join us in worship this morning. Um, I believe you can find the words online so that you could sing along with us because the Lord loves a joyful, worshipful noise. Father, we just thank you that we're even able to come before you this morning, that we're still free to come openly and worship and praise, because you are the only one who is worthy of all our worship and praise, God. We thank you for loving us. We just ask that you would be glorified among us, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit to be in our presence, Lord. Fill us.
our peace is in you so we can say it's well even when things are hard even when we're struggling or feeling lonely or out of touch Lord it's well because you are there you love us you have a plan we just need to turn to you Lord we need to lift our eyes up and look straight at you God we just thank you for everything that you are doing, Lord, and that you haven't left us or forsaked us. You are amazing, and we love you. God, we just ask that you would speak your word through Pastor Mike today, and that it would touch our hearts, Lord, and that it would just burn something in our memory that we would be thinking about all week, Lord, that we would continue to glorify you and grow closer to you, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. All right, welcome to Calvary Divine. Um, I said, Mike, you're going to teach. I thought you were coming up. <laughs> you're like, nope. All right, I hope you all have been a, uh, a wonderful week. Um, we met with um, Steve from the VFW uh, on Friday and with Marcus. And to kind of, do you all know they do Food Truck Friday over here now? So they do a food truck Friday over here at the VFW, and they have picnic tables and everything and cornhole the whole nine yards. So just FYI, I didn't know all that, or else I wouldn't have eaten dinner before I came out. Um, but we went over everything that's going to need to happen for, uh, for the prayer, prayer and worship night. So that's coming up uh, this Sunday. So it's this Sunday. We're going to start doing setup at 4, and uh, unfortunately we lost two of our worship leaders. They had a uh, death in the family, 
and so um, where uh, the the actual day, um, and and I understood the the day that they're they're having their life ceremony and memorial is actually the day of the of the event, and it's actually at five o'clock, and so we uh, completely understood. So we're gonna we got something else work, and I got to get with you on that, Sarah. You you know it's not just you. I got somebody else who's gonna possibly come out uh from from grace to to kind of fill in and so um and if not i mean it's okay i was just gonna have you come up and do one or two songs anyway so i was gonna put you on the spot anyway or i'll just have the rise worship band play a little bit longer you know but you're more than welcome to jump up there and get on vocals in the background it's all that stuff's possible uh so praise and worship night's going to be this coming sunday at 6 p.m. We have these, so if you want to grab some of these, and we've already got some businesses that have uh, been willing to put them in the window. Um, the other thing is, is the beauty salon and the pharmacy right down the street have all donated water for the event. So, and Steve and them are donating from the BFW chairs. So it's kind of fun to see the city kind of coming together and starting to uh to get ready for the event itself the other reason why i have this newspaper up here the event will be in the newspaper this week so it'll be we have a we'll have an ad that's in the newspaper this week but the church is in the paper now so and also should be on the website so if anybody asks you know where where the church is it's in divine it's all the information's on here uh phone number you know all that all that wonderful stuff that they need uh website all that stuff so so it's in the paper so that's done wednesday night uh 7 p.m bible study is going to be we're going to be in uh we'll be looking at the um the centrality of jesus christ and also the priority of the word we'll, we'll actually tackle those two chapters together um and then we're going to spend the next week dealing with the tri tribulation I, I need to make sure because i it may have been misunderstood Wednesday. I'm not sure how I, because I say a lot of silly stuff. Uh, and sometimes I'm thinking in my head it comes out the right way. But uh, as Calvary Chapel, we only believe in pre-tribulation. You can't be a Calvary Chapel and believe in mid-trib or millennialism, any of that other stuff. You can't. No. Okay. We're going to be taken up. And then the tribulation, all that stuff happens. I just And we'll go into that a lot more. I just want to make sure because if I if I shared something in scripture or I used a phrase, I don't want to I don't want to cause any confusion with anybody, um, and and it's very easy for somebody who went to school in Alabama to cause much confusion to a lot of people, uh, so it, it's it's possible. Uh, so uh, on October sixth, we'll be starting the book of Daniel. On October sixth, so that is a wonderful book. If you want to try to understand more about what's happening in the world today, because Daniel, and usually when they teach uh, that book, and, and uh, when we learned it in, in Liberty University, we learned the book of Daniel and Revelation together because they're, they're hand in hand. Uh, so if you want to understand in the times, that's how you, it's a great book. So if you want to understand what's going on in the world today, that'll be a good book for you to, to kind of get a better understanding of what's happening in the world. Uh, and then finally, the Tide boxes are in the back and also online. And so you can do that through the website at, at calvarydivine.org. And so we want to thank uh, those that have been doing that. It's been, I, we got people that tithe but don't come to church. And that's a blessing within itself because when that happens, it allows us to do, because look, a night of worship is not free. It's free for everybody to come. But we still have, there's still things that have to be put in place uh, for us to do it. So we thank y'all, um, you know, and, and what's going to happen is I've decided that uh, come October 1st, uh, we are going to start to tide uh, to the Gallegos in Irapuato, Mexico. Uh, we will take 10% of what we receive and it will be given to, uh, to them for their church and the mission they're doing. In Mexico and you say well why do we do that because everything that you tied here you're a part of that blessing that happens there 
and I don't think people realize that. And, and if we're supposed to teach people to, to tithe, if we're not doing it as a church, what are we teaching, right? So that's something I learned from Pastor Joe. Joe, that was something we always did at our other church. I'm gonna throw this over here. It was something we always did. So, and, and they actually support us as well, you know, through their, uh, through their giving. So I did talk to Joe. Joe's gonna be here probably sometime towards the end of the year to come teach on a Sunday. And then Pastor Hector's gonna be here to come teach on a Sunday because you're gonna one by one meet your board members and then hopefully Pastor Mitch will be here uh, from Calvary Chapel, Casterville. Those are the three guys that we're looking at to, to kind of, and so we have to set bylaws. I mean, that's a whole, I didn't know that. I was like, man, come on. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's still gotta happen but before the end of the year. And, and all that is for one, accountability for me Two, the other thing is too, is I need, I need to be able to, when I'm having things that are happening within the church or I need those voices and people that can pray and help. And if, man, the support that we're getting from my church for the praise, they're bringing all the sound. They were like, don't dig up the stuff out of your garage. We're just gonna bring it. And then they're providing a the sound guy too. So, well, no, you got, there's gonna be, don't go, because there are going to be plenty of, you got to set mics up there. Trust me, there's going to be a lot of stuff to do. So as far as setting mics up and all that other stuff. So there's plenty to do. So um, let's do this. And we're going to go ahead and get into our study. We're in the book of Mark chapter 1, verse 6. This is a really tough chapter because it deals with unbelief. And we see a lot of it in the world today. Um, uh, just in case anybody wanted to know, uh, the SEC team won yesterday. So Texas won yesterday, Texas A&M won yesterday, but the best team won yesterday, which was Georgia. So God bless that. You know, that was a good game to watch. But let's go ahead and get into the Word of God. I'm a, I'm a huge college football guy. And unbelievably, UCLA beat LSU, which was awesome. I would love to go to the Rose Bowl. That's a beautiful stadium. Let's get into the Word of God in Mark chapter 1, verse 6, uh, 1 through 6. And it says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not... Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Ehoses, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and his, in his own household. And he could not, do, uh, could not do no mighty work there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages' teachings. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We do, as we come before you, Lord, we pray if there's anyone here that may be dealing with any kind of unbelief, any kind of doubt, um, no matter what it is, Lord, that we could just give that over to you. Uh, that we would put our trust in you and, and that uh, uh, we would lay those things down and just give them over to you and, and uh, allow your direction to guide us, the Holy Spirit to guide us. I pray for the night of worship. I pray for Jarrell and, and the Rise worship team and, and, uh, and, and Pastor Wade who's driving from Houston. We pray for safe travel for him. I pray for Marcus and myself and, and, and just everybody here as we... Uh, we'll put this event together. I, I heard yesterday that nothing ever happens in divine. Well, something's going to happen in divine. <laughs> Whether 10 people come or, or even the small church comes, but we're going to go and worship the Lord and pray and just ask God to be, uh, to be Lord over the city and to wake up the churches uh, that we would get back to doing the work of the Lord and, and uh, serve in this community. Uh, we pray for unity. Uh, we pray for... Uh, just for uh, each person here, Lord, help them, grow them, and allow them to apply this word in their life. Uh, we thank you for those that, uh, uh, as we look at next week, we go into the, um, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and I pray 
you know, that's going to be a hard week for a lot of people. Uh, I pray that you would just be with them, the, the families, the friends, the, uh, the co-workers that all lost loved ones that day. Um, and then what ensued after, the people that joined the service because of 9-11. Um, I pray that it's something that as a, as a nation we can learn from, that our leaders would learn from. And I pray for our leaders, Lord. We see much confusion. We see a lot of selfish um, each person out for themselves, so to say. And, and I just pray, Lord, that we would get away from doing, doing that and start doing what's best for America. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you're doing. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today is Communion Sunday. So if you're watching online, uh, you may want to uh, uh, grab some crackers and, and some juice or some bread and some juice, so you'll be ready for that. I entitled the study, Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, is, uh, I entitled it, Jesus Marveled Because of Their Unbelief. Jesus Marveled Because of Their Unbelief. We'll look at it in three parts. Many questioned him in his, in his hometown, in verses 1 and 2. Many took offense at him, in verses 3 and 4. And many unbelieved, in verses 5 and 6. So last week we left off with uh, just this wonderful story of faith of two people. You had Yadas who fell at the feet of Jesus whose daughter was dying and died, right? And then you had the woman who had the uh, illness for 12 years, the bleeding for 12 years, who fell at the feet of Jesus and touched the hem and was healed. Both taking uh, huge amounts of faith to do, Right? And, and both hopeless situations. But this week we switch gears. We go back to Nazareth, right? And when we go back, what happens is we're going to be dealing with the struggle of unbelief. In John chapter 4, verse 44, it says, For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Now this is actually going to be the second visit and the last visit that Jesus will do in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was actually a small village. It was maybe 20 miles from Capernaum. And, and being that said, it was a day's walk. And it only had about 500 people living in the city. That's it. And they weren't known for much. Remember the disciple said that, that nothing good comes out of Nazareth, right? And so what we're going to look at is first is the, the, they're going to question him in his, own in his hometown in verses 1 and 2. And so it says he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. Something that's very important that we're going to see is what the, the disciples are with them on this trip. And they're there because next week when we get into our verses, Jesus is going to be sending them out. And they're going to, they're going to go out and, and they're going to meet people that have unbelief and that are going to reject the gospel. And so what happens this week is to set the stage for what's coming for the disciples. And so he's back in his hometown. We, we know that he was there two years earlier because of Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. And I won't go through the whole verses, but I'll, I'll kind of pull some stuff from here. And, and it says that when he came into Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and was his custom was to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath of that day, and he stood and read. So one of the things they do is he goes in to read in the synagogue. He, he pulls the scroll, and he pulls from the, uh, the prophet Isaiah. And then in verse 18 of Luke chapter 4, he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover Recover, recovering of the sight of, uh, to the blind and to set a liberty to those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now what he does is he rolls the scroll back, he puts it back, he sits down, and now when that's the point where the, the teacher would teach, the rabbi would teach, and, and he says in verse 21, as all eyes are fixed upon him, in verse 21 he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled, you're hearing. I'm the Messiah. That's what he was telling him in Nazareth, right? And, and one of the things you see is Jesus is going to marvel about unbelief today, 
But look what happens to the people in the synagogue. They, in verse 22 of Luke chapter 4, it says, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words. They marveled at the gracious words. And, and then, they, then the doubt starts showing up. And that they were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me uh, to me this proverb, Physicians, heal yourself. What we have heard you do, uh, do at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And so they're begging him to do the miracles that they had heard about. Right? And he tells them, and, and, and he gives them two examples, two examples of two Gentiles that were healed. One uh, and with Elijah when he uh, went to the widow uh, in Israel. And there was a famine, and he went and took care of her. And then the second he gave with Elisha, uh, with Naaman, the Syrian. Remember, we had talked about the, he had uh, leprosy. And so he healed both of them. And, and so when, when he gives them that example, they get upset. Because they're like, you're not going to do any work here? And in verse 28 of Luke chapter 4, it says, And when they heard this, these things all in the synagogue were filled with wrath with wrath so now they go from doubt to wrath and then it says in verse 29 and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of, of the hill of which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff but passing through their midst he went away this happened two years earlier now you got to remember now this is they they knew him for 30 years they they grew up with him and these are churchgoers, and what do they want to do? They want to kill them. They want to kill them. And, and so what we're going to see is we got an issue that's going to happen again. It's been two years. And now he's going to show back up. And what we have is not, it's not a, a, a matter of, is he Jesus, right? It's a matter of their heart. Their hearts are hard. And, and these were the religious people. These were the people that went to church. These, they were in the synagogue. And, it, and one of the verses I love is, is uh, in Jeremiah 17, 1. It says, Then the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of a diamond. It is engraved on a tablet of the heart and on the horns of their altars. It's, it's a hard heart. It is a hard heart. Jesus is not impressed with religion. Um, what we see is a, what happens is they have a pride-filled heart that turns to wrath. And, and it tells us what happens in that in Jeremiah 17, 9, verses uh, 9 and 10. Y'all are very familiar with these verses. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So the heart is deceitfully wicked. And believe it or not, everything that's running through your mind right now and your heart, God knows. Even sitting here in church. In verse 2 it says, uh, And the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many heard him and were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom given to him? And how are, how are mighty works done by his hands? So now we're back to the story. This is two years after where they tried to kill him. Jesus comes back and reminds me of Paul. Paul gets stoned to death, and what does he do? He wakes up outside the city. They threw him out thinking he was dead. Paul gets up and goes right back to the city and, and goes and preaches the word. People are going to reject the gospel. That's, you might as well go ahead and come to understand that. That's, that's, that's life. Uh, we all have members of our family or friends that we know that reject the gospel. And one of the things that we see here is now, as he enters the synagogue, he, he's going to be training the disciples, and he's teaching them and expounding and letting them know that they're going to reject you too. And when he says that many heard and were astonished in verse 2, it says, uh, you know, when we look at Mark chapter 1, verse 22, we, we saw them astonished before at his teaching. 
They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Remember, we learned that back in chapter 1. So they're astonished, but unfortunately, the natural person doesn't accept the things of God when their heart is hard. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They're astonished, but they're, sadly, they're just not growing. They're stuck. And, and these were the churchgoers. This is not even talking about the, the people that don't believe. These are just the people that are sitting in the church. One of the things I, all I had to ask myself, am I astonished when I sit and listen to somebody teach? Because I'm not listening to Jack Hibbs or I'm not listening to David Rosales. I'm listening to the Word of God. And I should be astonished by God's Word. What happens is over time we just go, ah, I know that scripture. Right? And that's a dangerous place to be. That's why we, we want the Word of God. We want It's not just about being astonished by the Word of God, but it's allowing the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and the wisdom and the power of that to transform your life. That's, that's what this is all about. It's, it's so you have application through God's Word to live. Not just Sunday and Wednesday. That's, your time with the Lord is very important. You know, but it's also your application. What is your application to live out? That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and of the spirit, of the joints and of the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the hearts. I love that verse because it tells you there's not anything that you can hide from God. Through, you think you got like a little crevice of stuff? Like God doesn't know about this stuff? Oh yeah, he does. And he'll bring it out. I talked to my dad this week. I, you know, I think when I saw the, the war is over thing go, I got upset. And stuff that I thought I had put back here or deep down in here came up like that. I told my dad, I was like, man, I don't know why I thought I, I was done with it. And my dad told me, he goes, Mike, there's some things that you just never, you know, they'll always be there. And then Teresa shared something that was really important. It's like, you have to remove the emotion from it. I was like, yeah. Why, why did I let it get me so upset? You know? But it was, it was in my heart. I didn't know it was there. And all it took was a little news. And Afghan war over after 20 years. And I was like, you serve in combat. Anybody who served in combat, we were like, we, you know, we left in defeat. It was heartbreaking. And so, you know, you, you think that you've got all that stuff hidden. And God shows you, hey, there's something here you need to deal with. And, and so just remember that. I mean, one of the things that we want is we want, you know, God's word to, to move us to truth. To move us to application. We yield to the truth. And then they say, they ask the next question, how are such mighty works done by his hands? So they're questioning him. Now you remember back in Mark chapter 3, verse 22... Remember they had, they had questioned, the scribes had said, uh, who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he cast out demons. So they can't explain this, so they're going to say, you know what, this ain't from God. Who, who allowed you to do these mighty works? That's what they're questioning. And that's where unbelief begins. Well, who said you could put a night of worship together? The Holy Spirit? I don't have to answer to nobody except God. It's a shame when I heard that. When nobody, they don't, never do anything here in divine. And I'm like, what? That stuff should be happening 
a lot. Churches should be out doing, outreaching. And I know we, we have a lot of churches that do BBS and stuff like that. That's an awesome thing because it's an outreach. But you know what? It's at the end of the day, we step out in faith. And we have to be careful with unbelief. And when we think that, well, where do you get this power to do this? Or what happens is it causes unbelief. People get defeated. Um, I, one of the things I thought about is, is you know, they, they talk about, well, where do you get this power to do this? And you think, well, he just resurrected somebody, right? Last week we were in that verse and he just resurrected somebody. And, and you think about the Lazarus with the, rich, with the rich man. Remember he tells him in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 30, 31, I won't read it because of time. But there's, there's a part of the verse where he talks about just send somebody to go tell my brothers. Because if somebody's resurrected, they'll believe. I mean, can I tell you something? No, they won't. You can have a miracle happen right in front of somebody and they will still question. They will still question. We'll have an event over there and you'll see movements. I've seen stuff happen already where, you know, where we see that Christian man down the street with his business say, I want to donate water. And that, that's all the Lord, man. But what happens is we, we I love the verse because it, it tells you in Luke chapter 16, it, it, one of the things that it says in, um, in the verse, it says, that he goes, I have for, in verse 28, he says, For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into the place of torment. But Abraham said, they, uh, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. No, they won't. Because this is what it says in the next verse, in verse 31. It says, He said to them, I said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that somebody should rise from the dead. Where does this mighty work come from? I hear this all the time. If I could just hear God's voice, it, it wouldn't help you. You would still question it because your heart's still hard. You're not willing to deal with your sin. You're not willing to deal with your addiction. You're not willing to deal with those things that need to be dealt with. You want to keep living that life. And guess what? You, if I could just hear God's voice. You have it in, in the Word of God. You have it by that person that's talking to you right now. You have it by God sending that person to pray for you. You have it by that person sharing the gospel with you. But what happens is that iron diamond pen written on a hard heart, and it's unbelief. So they're going to question him, and now they're going to take offense. In verses 3 and 4, it says, uh, is this not the carpenter? So let's stop right there. Now, is this not the carpenter? Not the Messiah. He told them two years before, earlier, when he read out of Isaiah. And what did they come back two years later? Is this not the carpenter? You know what the beautiful thing about a carpenter was back then? A carpenter just didn't build tables or work on wood or make chairs. A carpenter back then actually would work with stone. Uh, they would work with metal, and they would also work with sculpting or sculpting with clay. Now, every time I read Ephesians chapter two verse ten, for we are his workmanship, right? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I am so glad we have a carpenter. Because he's going to mold you and shape you to what you need to be. That's sanctification as, as a believer. But what happens is, is a lot of people consider Jesus just a carpenter or a good person or a great teacher. That's what most religions teach. The Muslims teach that Jesus was a wise teacher and a prophet. 
These are all false religions because they don't believe that God, he was fully God, fully man. And any religion that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man, is false religion. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through me, comes to the Father except through me. No one. It's through Jesus. The Hindus believe that Jesus was a saint and a holy man. See, every religion, false religions, has some sort of Jesus because it has to. To draw you in. The Buddhists believe that he was an enlightened man. Mormons believe that Jesus Christ was the firstborn spirit child. Jesus always existed. It says that in John. Right? Of a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. I have not read that anywhere in any Bible. Okay? They also believe that because Christ's atonement uh, secures immortality for virtually all people, whether they repent or believe. So they believe everybody's going to go to heaven because of what Christ did. And that's false. It's false. They also believe that you'll be a God one day, which is false. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ was a, a, an archangel, was Archangel Michael. He had existed prior to that, and, that, and now he's a lesser God. Can I read you just one verse? And this, should, this one verse should explain why. It's in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. A very important verse if you're sharing the gospel with anybody. We'll let that go through. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. I love this verse. He is, the Im he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in, in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. That's Jesus. That's God. That's the Messiah. And that's the carpenter. There should be no question of who Jesus is. And, and, and you know, that's why they brought it up that way. And, and, and then they go on to insult him after that. But they didn't call him just a carpenter. Now they're going to say the son of Mary. They didn't even use Joseph. Now that would have been an insult to use the mother's name back in the day because that's how the Jewish... Uh, would roll they, they the thing they would do is that they would have to use the father's name first but by using the mother's name first they were insulting jesus and that goes back to she was pregnant it's a 500 person town everybody knows joseph and mary's business right so it's kind of a slide so to say and then it says the brother of james uh, and ehoses uh, and judas and, and then simon Sadly, the brothers didn't even believe in Jesus. It's all brothers. Okay? So when, when we have family members, this is very important. When we have family members that don't believe, there's hope for us. Because we see after the resurrection, they came to know Christ. You know, they, it's very important that you know, we know that James and Judas wrote some of the Bible. But it says that in John 7, 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. His own brothers. And it says, and then in verse, the rest of the verse 3, it says, and they took offense at him. Now that word to take offense is in, in the Greek, it means to put a stumbling block in front of someone. So the person who's creating the doubt is now stumbling everybody else in the synagogue. You see what's happening? And, and that's what we have to be very careful with because 
what that person's do is, is he's placing a stumbling block to cause the person to begin to distrust the one who he should actually trust and obey. Now, we see this with a lot of things in our culture today. And I'm not going to get into all that, but I'm telling you, you need to be careful and make sure you're well read because there are a lot of people in certain agencies and certain things that are trying to put stumbling blocks in front of you to make you distrust the, the, the actual people you should obey. We trust God. You know, I, I saw something the other day and they said, well, we don't want artists and people to go perform in Texas. Good. Don't need you. Because I would rather stand with the Lord and stop abortions than have you come and perform. You know, if anything, God's going to bless what Texas is doing. And we're hoping that more states step up and do the same thing. This is the thing that's causing this nation to be judged right now. And, and sadly, I mean, er, er, we've had hurricanes and chaos or, you know, just mess after mess. We need to wake up. And thank God Texas decided to do something. And all these celebrities that are out there talking about the Texas Taliban and all this other stuff, we don't need you. Okay? It's funny because all your people are moving here. Right? Out of New York and California and Nevada and New Mexico, people are leaving. They're leaving those states because they can't, they can't be there anymore. It's, it's just gotten so crazy. But, you know, one of the things we have to remember is we can't put a stumbling block, especially with, about Jesus. Like, if you have unbelief or you're not sure about something, you should hold back and say, you know, I don't understand this. Can you explain this? Because if you go on and start preaching something different, that's why I was like, I was really, I want to make sure, because sometimes what I think comes out here, you know, I want to make sure, you know, because at the end of the day, I, I'm held accountable. I, I, man, for me, I, I want to make sure I get it right. I do not want to cause a stumbling block for any of y'all. But that's, that's what was, was being said here by them taking offense. And, and so, and this was happening, you know, uh, with his own people, his hometown, people who knew him. And I love the verse in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. It says, So there is honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builder, builders reject has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, a ro and a rock of offense. And they stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. Unfortunately, some people will just flat out reject Christ. And there's not a whole lot we can do about that. We just got to keep praying and keep, keep hoping that God will send. And maybe, maybe you burn that bridge and they don't want to talk to you no more. That happens. But we just got to keep sharing and hope and, and if you don't you don't have access to that person anymore just pray just pray that god will put somebody in their path you yeah, know because i mean there's a lot of people that are being led to believe things like satanism and and things that are uh, you know witchcraft and all this other stuff those are stumbling blocks i'll give you another one uh christian yoga that's a stumbling block Th those two words don't go together okay just you can do christian stretching without all the other you can just stretch you don't need to be you don't have to even call it anything in the army that's what we call it is stretching right and that's all it was so just fyi all right and it says and jesus said to them a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household and so Jesus is saying, you know, is, is given a solemn word in Nazareth. He, he spoke and taught, and yet they rejected him. And the people would, would reject Jesus, and, and guess what? Uh, they will be held accountable for the light that they denied. Two things that are going to happen, and it's very important, because as we get into communion here in a little bit, uh, two things that are very important for us to remember is there's a judgment that happens for all, Okay. You're either going to have the Bema Seat judgment, 
right? And that's Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. The Bema Seat judgment is for believers, uh, meaning that when, when, when you come before Christ, you're covered by the blood of Christ. You've given your heart to the Lord here on earth. You've repented of your sins, but you still have to give account for all you do. Everything you said, everything you thought, and then after that, based upon what what comes out of that you'll be either rewarded or you'll just be in heaven some of y'all may be just on still putting ambers out and you'll just be going on as you go in right but you're in because you gave your life to christ and you repented here on earth what happens to you if you reject an unbelief that's the great white throne of judgment very important that you understand these two those are the people that will end up in hell. Those are the people that's name has to be written in the book of life. It's, it's in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 11 through 15, if you want to read it, because it talks about the books being opened up. And, uh, and it says in the very last verse in, in Luke chapter 20, verse 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So hell is real. You, you choose to reject Jesus here, hell is real. And, and many of them took offense, and they took offense in unbelief. And the last little part here in verse uh, 5 and 6, we see many unbelieved. And he could not uh, do mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And so he was able to do some but not much work there. Uh, because the unbelief entered the work that needed to be done. He would save uh, some people there and, and heal them. But at the end of the day, one of the things that we see is that, that Jesus could have healed whoever in the town. But because of that unbelief, people, people didn't want nothing to do with, with Jesus. They rejected him. Remember when the demon-possessed man, what did that town do? You need to go. They rejected Jesus too. People will reject Christ. And so we, we have to step out in faith. One of the things as a church is we can't be hindered uh, and, and think that, well, God can't do that. We need to take that step of faith and understand that if God's placed that on your heart, we're going to step out in faith. You can't step out in little faith. you got to step out in faith and fully trust Him. You know, because God is the same uh, today, yesterday, and forever. He wants to work. He wants to. You don't think he wants to do a night of worship here? He don't want. I mean, come on. Even if it's just the church coming together to worship God, and pray for the city, and pray for the leaders of the city, and pray for our teachers, and our school district, all of that stuff needs to be. That should be, man. At the beginning of every school year, that should happen. As these kids, they, they face so much stuff that we didn't face in our day. And they need to be prayed over. And that last verse in verse 6, it says, And he marveled because of their unbelief. He went out and he went about among the village teaching. So he marveled. The other time that Jesus marveled was with the centurion. So you have him marveling in unbelief and marveling in faith. Remember the centurion said in, in Luke chapter seven, uh, Luke chapter seven and through seven verses uh, seven through nine, he says, uh, "But say the word and let my servant be healed." Just say it. And it, it, Jesus says in verse nine, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him and said, "I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith." See, what happens is when we have unbelief, our heart is set in unbelief. When we have a, a, a heart of unbelief, it's a dangerous place to be. You become skeptical, cynical. Some of, sometimes people, when their hearts are filled with unbelief, they're numb to sin. They just do it and don't have any remorse. That's how addictions happen. And all. But unbelief is clearly seen and known. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Even if our gospel is veiled, 
It is veiled to those who are perishing. It is veiled to, to uh, as Satan blinds them. And, and they're spiritually blind because that veil has been placed over them. And so what we have to pray for is that veil to soften, for their hearts to soften. It's because of hard hearts. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, it says, And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He even talked about this unbelief with his disciples, and, and we're going to learn this as we get to the end of the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 16, verse 14, it says, And afterward he appeared to eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after they had risen. There had been witnesses that were close to them, and they still rejected it. They should have been rejoicing. And yet, they were hidden in a room, and they had unbelief. And Jesus rebuked them. He not only says their unbelief, but he says their hardness of heart. So the text reveals to us that unbelief is actually, you know, as Jesus marveled at it, is, is actually one of the greatest sins that we can have. Because unbelief will actually send a person, will, will actually send a person to hell and keep them from heaven. Unbelief in the church hinders the work of God. Okay? Unbelief in the church hinders the word of God. And unbelief in the church hinders the work of God through the workers, the servants. It'll keep, keep them because they think, man, what are we doing? Uh, very simply, you could have, I've had events, you have 10 people, 15 people show up and you go, man, but one person came to know Christ. That's all, it was worth every bit of it. One person rededicated his life. It was worth every bit of it. To see the church work together, it was worth every bit of it. But see, that's what unbelief does. Oh, man, I don't know what we're doing. What, why are we out here? It's 90 degrees. You know, we'll go through all of that. So we need to be careful with the unbelief. If you're struggling today with unbelief, uh, I want to encourage you with a verse. We're going to actually get into this verse, which is a beautiful story. But in Mark chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, uh, Jesus is speaking to a man whose son is demon-possessed. Um, and, and, and he says to him, and Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for who one, belie one who believes. And, and the man responds immediately to the father of the child, cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When you're struggling with unbelief, that's a great prayer to, to, to pray. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. So our application, real quick, we'll run through these pretty fast. Application, first one. Jesus was rejected in his hometown. Have you been rejected by your family, your friends, or co-workers for, because you're a Christian? And has it stopped you from sharing the gospel? A lot of times people will get rejected and they just stop sharing the gospel. Don't stop. You see here that even in Jesus' hometown, people rejected him. And yet, what does he do? He goes on and keeps teaching. Second, they took offense to Jesus, which means they were placing a stumbling block in front of others, which caused others to detrust or, or, or not obey uh, Christ. Have you placed a stumbling block in front of someone, causing them to question or obey the word of God? That's pretty simple. You know, it could be by the way that you're living your life, by the way you're doing things. I'm a Christian, but you're doing stuff that doesn't line up with being a Christian. You're stumbling other people. And you need to deal with that. Third, have you allowed unbelief to find a home in your heart? And has it caused you to, your heart to become hardened? Because that's what it'll do. When you allow unbelief to go from here to here, it takes root. And you start, you start questioning everything. You question everything. And, and, and that's a, a hard place to be. I get it. But you, 
Lord, help my unbelief. You, you told me to do this. Help my unbelief. Okay? And, and so that's where we're at. So Communion Sunday. So today is Communion Sunday. It tells us that uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Um, one of the things that we do understand is in, verse, in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And so as uh, those that are watching online, I don't know where your state is as a believer. So I'm going to just, if you want to receive Jesus, in order to do communion, you have to be a follower of Christ. And, and there's four things that you, you need to do uh, to become a follower of Christ. Because realistically, if not, you have that unbelief and you reject Christ, hell is your destination. Not unless you change that. And, and so, uh, first thing we have to do is we have to admit that we're a sinner. And as we admit that we're a sinner, we ask for forgiveness, we repent of our sins. And then we believe that, that Jesus Christ was, died on the cross and was resurrected. And we receive Christ into our heart and allow him to be Lord of our life. It tells us that, you know, that each one of us are, none of us are good, no, no not one. And so, none of us are, we're all sinners. We're, we're, we were, we're all guilty, but Jesus died on the cross, and, and you can be not, not guilty today. You'd be covered by the blood of Christ and, and be heaven bound, right? And so just pray this prayer after me. Uh, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask forgiveness of my sins. I believe in my heart that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Be my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. And help me to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, it tells us uh, for us as believers that we are to examine ourselves before we are to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Sarah's going to come up and play. And, uh, and this is a moment for you. As Wayne is going to come around and pass out the elements, uh, it's a moment for you to do business with the Lord. Uh, you go, well, what, what do you mean? Uh, how's your month since the last time we took communion? Do you need to pray over something? Is there something going on in your life? Is there something you need to ask Christ for forgiveness of? That's what communion is. It's a, it's a celebration of the time that you gave your life to Jesus. And remember where you were at there and where you're at now. It's amazing. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll let Sarah play and then we'll, I'm going to step out the way here.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We do pray again. Uh, just thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. We pray, Lord. We are uh, struggle sometimes with that, that Adam sin, that, that natural thing that we were born with. And Lord, I pray uh, if there's anyone here that struggles with unbelief or doubt, uh, that walked in the door struggling with faith, that you would strengthen them today. Uh, through your body, and we thank you, Lord, and we ask that in Jesus' name. You may go ahead and partake of the bread. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, the, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drank it in remembrance of me. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, and I pray, you know, as we walk out these doors lord that we would be salt and light we thank you lord that you've forgiven us of our sins we ask lord that you would help us through this month to live for you uh to be able to share the gospel for you and and just to see uh, your hand work uh, throughout each of our lives through the marriages through the families uh, through this county and through this city lord we thank you, Father God, just for all that you're doing. And we thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross for us as we were guilty. Uh, and yet, we are innocent because of what you did on the cross and because of the blood that you spilt, Lord. You may go ahead and partake of the, the juice. Uh, I hope that you have a wonderful week, and I hope that we see you, if I don't see you Wednesday. That we see you Sunday, uh, well, hopefully Sunday, but Sunday evening next week at 6 p.m. Uh, chairs will be out there, uh, so VFW is providing the chairs. So, um, and from my understanding, the weather is supposed to. We're supposed to have a uh, a cold front. It's supposed to be 91. Um, it's we're going to have some weather come through earlier on Sunday morning. And uh, so if we're supposed to be uh, cloudy skies and it's only supposed to be 91. And so by six o'clock it'll start. We have shade over there too. So there'll be places for you to sit, sit in the shade and, and also hopefully you come out. And don't, don't let the weather keep you from coming to worship God. Okay? Let's not do that. Let's, let's show up and, and don't just show up. Bring somebody. Okay? Because it's not just a Christian event. You're supposed to grab somebody and bring them. Say, hey, you're going to go with me to a concert. A lot of Calvary Chapel pastors and hippies were saved that way. <laughs> because they were, they were told they were going to the concert. They thought they were going to a concert concert. And they ended up at a church. And they ended up giving their lives to the Lord. I know David Rosales and some other guys that, that went through that same thing. So, uh, so please come out and, 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 and participate. If you need to get a hold of me... For anything at all, calvarydivine.org. And now we're in the newspaper too, so you can find us in the, the Divine newspaper as well. Uh, we thank y'all. God bless y'all. I hope that y'all have a wonderful week, and uh, God bless y'all online as well.